Hi, I'm Nancy Bame. Welcome to our fourth installment in our lecture series on race and technology. Uh, if you've been here before, you know that uh, we've had we're putting some of the best speakers in this field on display so that we can all uh, get some insight into our critiquing our present technological situation and imagining better futures. And in that regard, we're extremely excited by today's speaker, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, who's really one of the best speakers on this topic. Um, our previous talks are available on uh, our channel and we'll have links for those in the chat. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be looking through them and answering some during the presentation and some during a live Q&A following. Um, let me tell you about Ruha, sorry. Um, Dr. Benjamin is an enthralling storyteller, a brilliant scholar, and a fierce advocate for all things just. She's a professor of African-American studies at Princeton University, where she studies the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity, knowledge and power, race and citizenship, and health and justice. She does it all. As the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, she brings together students, educators, activists, and artists to rethink and retool data for justice. Dr. Benjamin is the author of Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code, editor of Captivating Technology, and she's currently working on her fourth book, Viral Justice, How We Grow the World We Want, born out of the twin plagues of COVID-19 and police violence. At the center of all Dr. Benjamin's work is the invitation to quote, imagine and craft the world's, worlds we cannot live without, just as we dismantle the ones we cannot live within. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the new Jim Code, reimagining the default settings of technology and society. And I wanna start with some words from one of my favorite writers, Tony Cade Bambara. Not all speed is movement. Here, she wasn't talking about technology specifically, but I think it can be applied. The fact that too often we assume that technological innovation is the same thing as social progress, when in fact many technologies can actually deepen social inequality and injustice. Applying this to machine learning specifically, when we think of deep learning, I want to suggest that computational depth without social and historical depth is in fact superficial learning. We saw this in the specific context of Tay, when uh, Tay was released into the wild, shall we say, um, as some people commented, uh, Tay went from being humans are really cool to full Nazi in less than 24 hours. Um, when one user tweeted, you're a stupid machine, Tay accurately responded, I learned from you and you are dumb too. So how do we actually foster this depth when we think about deep learning. We have to be able to read social reality with greater precision and accuracy to understand not only the institutional patterns and inequities, but the interpersonal dynamics that continue to sediment inequality. And when it comes to anti-blackness and white supremacy specifically, we have to understand how racism distorts our ability to read reality. It distorts not only how we see the world, how we interact, but it can even distor uh, distort how we understand ourselves in the world, false sense of superiority or inferiority. A few examples of this everyday anti-blackness that I want to put on the table. A few years ago, this image was leaked from Miami PD showing the faces of young black men that were used for target practice. Now we can imagine if these are the faces that are used to practice shooting, it's no wonder that we get the more spectacular headlines and hashtags of many of these same individuals experiencing the lethal force of racist police violence. What's interesting to note here though, is that it's not only the everyday forms of anti-blackness that we need to shine a light on, what happens behind closed doors, but we also wanna shine a light on the everyday forms of anti-racism. In this Miami case, there were a group of clergy, majority of them white, who created the hashtag, use me instead. And they put their own faces there as a way to call out the violence and brutality of law enforcement. And so we want to build on this tradition as we think about our own roles in our own professions. It's moving from policing to preschool, a study from some colleagues over at Yale, 
put eye tracking technology on preschool teachers and then have them look at little children playing together and ask them to look for the challenging behavior. And the vast majority of teachers' attention invariably went to the little black kids in the playgroup, even though they were behaving the same way as all the other children. In fact, they were higher child actors instructed on how to behave. So whether we're talking about profiling in adulthood or in childhood, we see this spectrum of everyday anti-blackness that is a symptom of our distorted vision. Zooming the lens out even further to think about the general public, a study out of Stanford presented white Americans with data on the racial disparities in our jails and prisons and asked these individuals whether they would be willing to support reforms to the policies that actually produce these disparities. In California, that would be the three strikes law. In New York, the stop and frisk policy. And in both cases, the more data that these individuals were presented, the less likely they were to want to support policy reform. So the researchers remind us that using statistics to inform the public about racial disparities can backfire. Worse yet, it can cause some people to be more supportive of the policies that create those inequalities. So what's happening here between the data and people's cognition? We can think of them as distorting lenses, interpretive uh, frameworks, racist lies that people use to understand and interpret that data to actually justify that much higher rate of incarceration. And so for me as an educator, the take home is that we have to care as much about what's happening in here, the stories that we tell about the social world, as we do the statistics, because the facts alone will not save us. Thinking about how we got to this point where we have inherited and continue to perpetuate these distortions, we don't need to just look at how ignorance plays a factor. We need to look at how science has played a role in erecting this racist architecture and hierarchies. There are many individuals I could point to, one in particular shown here, French naturalist George Cuvier. Cuvier wrote, the white race with oval face straight hair and nose to which the civilized people of Europe belong and which appear to us the most beautiful of all is also superior to others by its genius, courage, and activity to which he, of course, compared the Negro race marked by black complexion, crisp of woolly hair, compressed cranium, and flat nose, the projection of the lower parts of the face and thick lips evidently proximate to the monkey tribe the hordes of which it consists have always remained in the most complete state of barbarism. So we see that there's a lot going on here with Cuvier and his assumptions. One is to just take note of this juxtaposition between blackness and whiteness. If we think about living and inher- living in this racist architecture, these are twin pillars that hold up these hierarchies. To understand the supposed superiority of whiteness, it needs a foil and other, and that has historically been blackness. Secondly, we see here that Cuvier and his colleagues aren't just talking in the abstract about white civilization in general and black people um, generically, but they're mapping these hierarchies onto something seemingly concrete, namely the body. Why is that? Why has every single part of the black body been dissected and put under the microscope looking for signs of inferiority? Well, because the more that we think about race and racist hierarchies as natural, fixed, immutable, God-given, the less likely we are to question them, much less try to change them. So one thing we can all do yesterday to begin to dismantle this racist architecture is to reject the naturalization of race, the, the talk of inherent qualities, whether we're talking about IQ or, or athletic prowess. Anytime these attributes and behaviors are purported as natural, they uphold this racist architecture. The last thing I want to point out before moving on is that often when we hear these examples from the past, people respond, well, we can't judge Cuvier and other racist scientists by our standards today. We can't impose our values on them. Well, in fact, uh, people during Cuvier's own lifetime were already rejecting the, the scientific racism. In fact, Cuvier's own student, one Friedrich Tiedemann, not only questioned his teacher, not only called out the bigotry associated with his so-called science, but published refutations unpacking and dismantling 
the scientific fallacies embedded in them. And so just like Use Me Instead is a contemporary example, Tiedman and his work is another example of an individual that is standing up for anti-racism. And this is the tradition. These are the shoulders on which we can build. So coming again to our present, we see that pop culture, visual culture continues to reproduce these racist associations. The first time that a black man is on the cover of Vogue, LeBron here, is positioned in the same way as this World War I propaganda poster in his demeanor, in his posture, all the way down to his sneaker choice is meant to evoke the brutishness of blackness. Whereas in World War I, the brute represented the German Here we see not only LeBron, but note the twin pillars. LeBron is not on that cover alone. And the way that Giselle is positioned is meant to accentuate the racial and gender distinction between these two individuals and thereby the groups that they represent. And so we have to continue to question the color-coded nature of our media, um, that the cartoons that our children watch, the way that darkness is, is continually associated with, with badness and evil and goodness with, with lightness. And so we come to technology, which is not immune from these racist associations. It's part of this fishbowl. Um, if you go and do a simple Google Images search, type in unprofessional hairstyles, you'll see images like the ones on your left, professional hairstyles on your right. And you see a pattern emerge in which black women's natural hair is coded literally unprofessional a la uncivilized, going back to Cuvier. And so our technology is mirroring back at us these ongoing everyday forms of racist judgment. In fact, it's so common that some states have begun to pass laws around hair-based discrimination as a variant of racism. In California, it's called the Crown Act. So the question for us is, what do we do when we see ourselves mirrored back in this way? What is the responsibility to not only change the algorithms, but change the social dynamics that are reflected in the technology or in the algorithms? So over the last year and a half, we have encountered a public health health crisis in which these fault lines and inequities have come to the surface. And so for many people, when they're presented with a problem, let's say like the fact that medical students and physicians routinely underestimate the pain of black patients, they might presume that technology will save us, that if only we outsource these important medical decisions to AI, that would be able to bypass these racial biases. And by the end of my talk, I hope that you not only will question question this assumption of outsourcing important decisions to technology, but understand why this, uh, why this is um, so misguided. To do that, we have to move beyond techno-determinism. This is just a fancy way of naming the assumption that technology will save us or perhaps slay us. There are two variants of techno-determinism. On your left is the techno-dystopian story that we tell. Hollywood loves to sell us this in the form of Terminator, Matrix, and the list goes on, where the robots, here the robots is a kind of shorthand for thinking about automation and AI more broadly, The robots are going to take away human agency, devour humanity. Um, They're going to take all the jobs. Everything bad is associated with tech development. On your right is the techno-utopian story that technology is going to save us. And of course, this is the, the story that Silicon Valley is working mightily to sell us. If we would just hand over important decisions to AI, everything would be more efficient, more fair. And although these seem like opposing narratives, they have different endings, one in which we're helped, one in which we're harmed. They actually share this underlying logic of techno-determinism that we are affected by technology, but the social agents and agencies behind the screen are missing from the script. The assumptions, the values, the ideologies that animate, that become encoded in our socio-technical systems. And so as a a step towards reclaiming um, our power and democratizing technology, we have to be able to see who and what is behind the screen that's currently animating um, the digital world in which we all are forced to inhabit. This is easier to do in hindsight. It's easier to look at 
past forms of technology and to question them and to see their social dimensions. For example, this 1957 Mechanics Illustrated magazine, the robots are coming. And when they do, you'll command a host of push-button servants. In 1863, it says, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. So there's a lot going on on this page, as you see here. I'm just going to point out a couple things before moving on. One is just to take note of this date. 1957. What's happening in the social milieu? What's changing? How are the people who usually do the free and cheap labor in the domestic sphere, dressing you, combing your hair and serving you meals in a jiffy, beginning to push back? beginning to refuse this second class status, whether we're talking about the women's movement or the civil rights movement, those who are doing this everyday labor are beginning to reclaim their power and thus a need for technology that would take their place. The second thing to note is this one little word, we'll all have robot slaves again. That tells us who the future beneficiaries of this technology is. Certainly not those who are the descendants of people who were enslaved the first time. So in that one word, we begin to see how the users of these robot slaves are raced, classed, gendered. Without race, class, or gender ever being mentioned, they're encoded. These interlocking systems are encoded in this one little word. So we have to be able to read beneath the surface to see both the social inputs, why this technology is being developed, when it's being developed, and also the outputs, who it's for, who it excludes. And so in the same way that we would read the past with this critical lens, we have to be able to read the present similarly. Earlier this year, we seem to have come a long way when it came to so-called robot, our digital assistants. Um, some of you will recall that the most popular Super Bowl ad was one featuring the actor Michael B. Jordan as the embodiment of Alexa. Here we find a black woman user, Jordan, uh, imagining Jordan as the sexy voice of her AI device. A far cry from robot slaves in 1957, or is it? When I saw the ad, three things came to mind. The very same time that Amazon rad, ran that Alexa ad, the company was trying to crush the unionization of mostly Black and Latinx workers in its Bessemer, Alabama warehouse. I wonder if we asked this Black woman shown here and the many others who have to deal with the oppressive work conditions what their idea of inclusive technology looks like if a bubble bath with sexy Black Alexa would top the list. In this way, cosmetic representation in the form of the ad too often takes the place of substantive change in the real conditions of people's lives. The second thing that comes to mind was the case of a black computer scientist, Jason Mars, who runs a tech startup. When his company's smartphone app talks, it sounds like, quote, a helpful young Caucasian female, he said. So, he wanted to try designing the app to sound more like him, but ultimately didn't, saying that, quote, there's a kind of pressure to conform to the prejudices of the world when you're trying to make a consumer hit, he said. It would be interesting to have a black guy talk, but we don't want to create friction either. First, we need to sell products. Ah, friction. There it is again. Frictionless technology for some in deepens the social frictions for others. The Super Bowl ad also brought to mind the research of Christoph Barknek and colleagues, and they looked at how study participants, majority of whom identified as white, respond to darker and lighter robots. First, they noted that if robots have anthropomorphic features like eyes or a face, people will often look at the color of the machine and, if asked, they'll assign the robot a racial category. They also reported that when asked to respond to a threatening robot or human, participants were faster to shoot an armed black robot and human than they were to shoot their white counterparts. The study subjects were also faster to refrain 
from shooting unarmed white humans and robots than unarmed black figures. So I I don't think there's an easy typology in which to fit these examples. Black Alexa, Bessemer workers, Jason Mars, and black robots. Nor should there be. I think the way that race, class, gender, and embodiment converge with perceptions of threat and desire defy any easy appeal to, quote, inclusive design. And the more that conversational computing heads into hospitals, homes, schools, workplaces, senior care, and more, I want to encourage us to work harder to understand how technology reflects, reproduces, and potentially resist social oppression in varying ways. So how do we do this? Let me offer three main insights to get started. First is this idea that racism is productive, not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things, of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, forward-looking, productive. In my field of sociology, we often say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I want us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another, because more and more people are accustomed to thinking and talking about the ethical and social impacts of technology, but that's only half of the story, because social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impacts, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and social control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce a fragmented imagination, misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one that's grounded in justice and joy, we can't only wrestle with the critique and what the harms are of these technologies, but we also have to think about the deep investments, the desire even that many people have for social domination. Consider a relatively new app called Citizen, which sends real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it'll show you incidents as red dots on a map, which um, so, so that you can avoid particular areas, which is a slightly less racialized version of other apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid certain areas. Now, some of you are probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong in the age of barbecue Beckys calling the police on Black people, cooking, walking, breathing? bird watching out of place. It turns out that even a Stanford educated environmental scientist shown here living in the Bay Area can be an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting too that that app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. As one member of the New York City Council put it, crime is now at historic lows in the city, but because residents are constantly being bombarded with push notifications of crime, 
they believe the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Not only is this categorically false, he says, it's distracting people from very real public safety issues like reckless driving or ri uh, rising opioid use that don't show up on the app. What's most important to our discussion, I think, is that citizen and other tech fixes for social problems aren't only about technology's impact, but also about how social norms and structures, racial norms and structures shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. So this is the dynamic that I've taken up in, in two new books. The first one examines the interplay between race automation and machine bias as an extension of older forms of racial domination. The second is an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technology across a wide range of social arenas, from more traditional sites like policing and prisons to less obvious contexts like fintech, healthcare, and the dig digital service economy. In terms of popular discourse, what got me interested in these issues was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes like these. A few years ago, there was a first wave of stories that seemed to be shocked that technology is not neutral. Then there was a second wave that seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address the default settings of racist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are being used to differentiate us. Take, for example, a recent study. Racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sick or black patients, reports Obermeyer and colleagues, in which the researchers were actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note here is that this algorithm doesn't explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it's race neutral. By using costs to predict healthcare need, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. In my review of this study, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital if the predictions were actually based on need rather than cost. So we see that race neutrality can actually be a deadly force. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new Jim Code, innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. So whereas my grandmother might have walked up to the front of the hospital and seen a big whites only sign or an arrow pointing to the Negro wing, I can walk through the front door, but there may very well be an automated system making decisions about my care that allocates resources in such a way that has a similarly discriminatory effect. This formulation considers then how the reproduction of racist forms of social control entails a crucial socio-technical component that on, not only hides the nature of racism, but allows it to penetrate every facet of our lives under the guise of progress. So to encourage us to think about how anti-Blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, I consider four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that fall along a kind of spectrum, from the most obvious, engineered inequity, to the most insidious, techno-benevolence. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to dive a little deeper into the last two before moving towards a conclusion. Coded exposure names the tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized people and calls for digital recognition and inclusion, the desire to literally be seen by technology. But inclusion into harmful systems is no public good. Rather, the act of viewing something or someone may put the object of our vision at risk. 
what I'd like to underscore is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight, as that first image showed, but also in the danger of being too centered that racialized groups are made vulnerable, though not without creative resistance, as I'll come back to in just a moment. But first, a brief interlude that illustrates one side of this dynamic. Hello? Motion sensors. Motioning. Motioning. Please sense me. Oh, uh, one other thing. Lem mentioned that there's uh, something weird going on with the motion sensors in the lab. Oh, yeah. We replaced all the sensors in the building with a new state-of-the-art system that's going to save money. It works by detecting light reflected off the skin. Well, Lem says it doesn't work at all. Lem's wrong. It does work. Although there is a problem. It doesn't seem to see black people. This system doesn't see black people? I know. Weird, huh? That's more than weird, Veronica. That's basically, well, racist. The company's position is that it's actually the opposite of racist because it's not targeting black people, it's just ignoring them. They insist the worst people can call it is indifferent. Well. Nothing. We never should have let that white guy off. We're eight black men in an elevator. Of course the white guy's gonna get off. Veronica? Oh, God, this looks way too aggressive. No, it's okay. I think I know why you're all here. Well, most of you. <clears throat> um, I have something prepared. Um, Veronica, you are a terrific boss. Thank you, Lem. I'll take it from here. Let me start by apologizing on behalf of Viridian for this inexcusable situation. I laid into Veronica pretty good. I figured it was my only shot, so I took the gloves off. Oh, that sounds great, Lamb. Sounds like you gave the company a really strong message. Oh, yeah. She said they're working 24-7 to make things right. Can you believe this? I know. Isn't it great? We all get our own free white guys. You like it? Yeah. Hey, Ty's the best. He anticipates everything I need. Plus, he picked up my dry cleaning. Oh, and he got this kink out of my neck. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, my guy sucks. Well, maybe you're just not using yours right. Yeah, maybe it's on you, dude. Shut up, Stu. I got the worst black guy. <laughs> It turned out Lem had also been thinking about the money issue, and he put together some interesting numbers to show us. And then, we all went to speak to management in a language they could understand. Within a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. And so, if the company keeps hiring white people to follow black people, to follow white people, to follow black people by... Thursday, June 27th, 2013. Every person on Earth will be working for us. And we don't have the parking for that. No way. So that was a clip from uh, the show Better Off Ted, which is now off the air, and it's called Racial Sensitivity. Among other things, the show depicts how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, the prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development work together to ensure that innovation literally produces containment. The fact that black employees are unable to use the elevators, doors, water fountains, or turn the lights on is all treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. But good for whom is what we have to continuously ask. During the pandemic, the stakes of coded exposure have grown more pronounced. And one of the most tangible examples is the widespread use of the pulse ox by patients in their homes as a way to help them determine when to seek urgent care. As my MIT colleague Amy Moran Thomas writes in this Boston Review piece, 
Like the problems magnified by the coded gaze of algorithms elsewhere, even small racial disparities could amplify unequal outputs. Beyond the pulse ox, this also matters for other wearable chromatic devices and the algorithms they feed. Pretending that they're colorblind can further amplify health disparities. Finally, some of the most interesting developments, I think, are those we can call techno-benevolence that aim to address bias in various ways. Take, for example, new AI techniques to vet job applicants. A company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using an AI-powered program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expression, posture, vocal tone, and then compares job seeker scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. The sheer size of many applicant pools and the amount of time and money that companies pour into recruitment is astronomical. So companies like HireVue step into the mix and narrow the eligible pool at a fraction of the time and cost, and hundreds of companies worldwide have signed on. Another value added according to HireVue is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make, quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider that question in light of a study by a team of computer scientists here at Princeton, which examined whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white-sounding names with pleasant words and black-sounding names with unpleasant ones, which builds on a classic audit study from about 2003, which sent out old-school resumes to employers in Boston and Chicago and found a very similar rate of discrimination. A white-sounding name received 15% more callbacks than their black counterparts. So, too, with gender-coded words and names, as Amazon learned last year when its hiring algorithm, or a few years ago by now, uh, discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot, beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers, perhaps, looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. As this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist bot. Bring us back to that that, uh, problem space we started with. Though it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In fact, there was one HR employee for a major company that recommended we slip the words Oxford or Cambridge into our CVs with invisible white text to pass the automated screening. But in terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. In terms of legal protections, the Algorithmic Accountability Act and the Ending Platform Monopolies Act in the U.S. are a good start, but in no way sufficient to really transform the infrastructure and ecosystem of tech development. But another thing that makes me somewhat hopeful is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, thousands of Google employees condemned the company's collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective. And a growing number of Microsoft employees were opposed to the company's ICE contract, saying that, quote, As the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And I would encourage folks to check out this hashtag, tech won't build it, to get a keener sense of this movement. And in just the last few months, earlier this year, I'd say, the Alphabet Workers Union has been gaining momentum among workers at Google and beyond. As this article published by Science for the People reminds us, 
contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across many institutions, can draw from past organizers' experiences in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today, which includes building solidarity across class and race. In terms of pedagogy, I'll just mention one concrete resource everyone can download called the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook, developed by some wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. The aim of this intervention is threefold to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, an emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. In terms of civil society, initiatives like Data for Black Lives, the Detroit Community Technology Project, the Design Justice Network, and Color Coded LA offer an even more expansive approach, galvanizing communities to transform paranoia about surveillance into power and to take a proactive approach to tech justice. The fact is, data disenfranchisement and domination has always been met with resistance, in which activists, scholars, and artists have sharpened abolitionist tools that employ data for justice. This is a tradition in which, as Du Bois exclaimed, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were being lynched, murdered, and starved. From his modernist data visualizations representing the facts of Black life on your left, to Ida B. Wells Barnett's expert deployment of statistics in the Red Record, there's a long tradition of employing and challenging data for liberation. Towards that end, the late critical race scholar, Harvard professor Derek A. Bell, encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals, insisting that, quote, to see things as they really are, we must imagine them for what they might be which is why I'm convinced that the arts and humanities have such a vital role to play in any discussion and movement around data justice. One of my favorite examples of what, what we might call a bellion racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-Black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high risk areas to encourage, quote, citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design this algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a so-called criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by emerging technologies. And so when we return to that issue of diagnosing black pain, we also have to flip the script there. Rather than relying on doctor reports to train AI, researchers have found that Black patients' self-reports of pain is a more accurate source of information because it matters who we listen to, whose knowledge we value. Before a single algorithm is developed, how we frame any question and what data we draw on to answer it 
This is where we first encode power. So here's my final proposition. If it is the case that inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of our society, we saw it in policing, preschool, public perceptions, pop culture, and more, that means each twist, coil, and code is a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. The vastness of the problem that we're up against will be its undoing once we accept that we are pattern makers. So if, as I suggested at the start, the carceral imagination captures and contains, then that means a liberatory imagination can open up possibilities and pathways. It can create new settings, encode new values, and build on intellect, critical intellectual traditions that have continuously developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. And my hope is that we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ruha. Uh, we got a lot, a lot, a lot of questions, and I see that you have been diligently answering answering many of them. Um, I've been trying to to call some of them and and pick out some overarching themes and maybe some underlying questions. I'm I wanted to start with the question that I think comes up a lot with people who um, are not as deep into this field as you and which is the question of whether drawing attention to racism and technology exacerbates it, makes for more of it, creates division, um, mm -hmm. given all of the wonderful things that technologies have done for us. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the way that I boil it down is the false idea that talking about a problem produces the problem. And we don't take that same tact when it comes to other kinds of ills, namely physical ills. Ignoring our physical uh, illness doesn't magically make it go away. Similarly, if you want to address racism, we have to actually dissect it. We have to understand how it is produced, why it continues in order to address it. And so I would just encourage those who either are uncomfortable or or have a, a share this notion that you know talking about the relationship between racism and technology is the source of the problem i think is misguided it's a misattribution of of what the source is and what what the only way really to address it is to pay attention to it to understand it in order to counteract it. And so that's what not just I, but a number of people well before emerging technologies have been doing, whether it has to do with racism in the law, racism in education and healthcare, the people who are studying it and are trying to advocate um, various forms of anti-racism are, um, are not the ones actually perpetuating it. Despite what you may hear on the news these days. Um, there's there's a number of questions that I think get at some questions around is with you, you talk about creative methods um, we 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 talk about we talk about who's designing designing these technologies is a question of there being more designers who are not white people what what is the role of of design in this in this practice where where, where does that change happen I mean, I think we have to understand design as um, as political from the start. Again, it kind of relates to the first question. Talking about racism or inequality and design is not politicizing design or politicizing the technology. It is inherently political. Um, and you're 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 posing a problem to which you're trying to derive a solution. Um, and so depending on, not just who is posing the problem, but from what perspective, how they frame the problem, that kickstarts a whole set of, um, of potentialities that either narrow the field of who's included, whose worldviews, experiences uh, of technology and otherwise are part of the framing and what's left out. And so um, while the idea that we should diversify the tech workforce is important, it's part of should be part of our conversation. Um, you know, we think about MLK's idea about you know integrating a burning house. Like I don't want to integrate a burning house, 
And so we don't need to just diversify the tech industry as it is. We need to think about if the tech industry as it has been established, as it's set up in terms of what its guiding values are, what the protections are, et cetera, if that is, if, if it's enough just to diversify it as it is, will that naturally, magically transform the kinds of things that are produced and designed? And I, I don't think it is. Um, I think too often um, the conversation of diversity is a good starting point, but it ends up being this permanent placeholder for thinking about even more substantive and transformative change which respect, with respect to the relationship between tech development and the body politic and, and society, where um, it, should be much, it should be much more democratized beyond just who's doing the designing, whose worldviews, whose perspectives, whose framing of the problem is ground zero, is the starting point for design. I love that. And it leads it leads right into a question that I had while listening to you talk. So I'm going to pull uh, moderator's prerogative. You talk you talk at a number of points about um, things being good for some, but then causing troubles for other or frictionless for some and then causing more more friction mm -hmm. for others. And I'm wondering how how you think about who gets to decide what's good enough, who gets to decide what mm -hmm. is how much friction is too much friction? Mm -hmm. is, is it about changing the very processes through which technology gets constructed? and Or, or what is it about for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, 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 a way to understand what has to change is the processes, how we do it, not just what we want in the end. So you can get inclusive products. Someone mentioned facial recognition technology in the chat. You can get facial recognition that works on everyone, and you can produce it through a very coercive process. And there's examples of that that I won't get into now. And once you have that inclusive, quote unquote, inclusive product, it can be used to harm a diverse set of populations. <laughs> and so the process, both before and after um, creating any given technology uh, is important. And another idea that I sort of post in the chat, I'll just uh, amplify here, is that it, we need to think about what community-driven digital stewardship is. There are organizations and initiatives that are working and trying to hone different models of communities deciding what is in their best interest, what will serve them um, best, and how to invest public resources, and what processes should guide not just the creation of, say, a given technology, but stewardship means that even once it's created, you have a process in which people get to govern and oversee and shape how it is um, implemented. And so uh, some of the organizations that I mentioned in the talk, I would encourage people to start with. You can also go to the resources tab of, of my website, ruhabenjamin.com backslash resources. Again, it's thinking about different models of producing and stewarding technology that is not driven by corporate interests. Speaking of corporate interests, there's there's a question about how you laid out in 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 uh, I think it was Jesse Daniels and her colleagues suggestions. Um, the idea about uh, creating ways of having conversations about racism in ways that are stressful but safe and uh, and somebody asked whether you have thoughts on on how to effectively make space for these kinds of conversations within corporate contexts, expressing frustration that it seems like we we read press releases, but but within don't necessarily feel like we we have, we're empowered to make the change that we might want. And related to that, somebody uh, asked about corporate DEI teams focusing on equity in the workforce, but not in the products. And and so, I'm, do you, do you have any advice for those of us in tech who would like to be? more effective in our organizations and opening these conversations? Yeah, I think that many of the same challenges, actually, you know, the university is also a corporation in, in, in many ways. Um, and so many of the challenges of how to authentically, substantively um, address these issues within the university, they mirror the kind of challenges in, in um, the tech industry. And I think um, the way that it has been approached We'll just take the last year in terms of the kinds of statements, um, the occasionally the kind of figureheads, the tokenistic forms of inclusion where you have one or two or a handful of individuals who represent diversity hires. All of these big public um, kind of reputation washing 
um, uh, responses, um, I think hide the day to day. Um, and it's and I don't think of them as, as microaggression or micro anything because they're such an assault on the everyday experiences of people who work in these settings. But my my suggestion is to put under the microscope the things that you most take for granted in your organization, in your corporation or university, the things that you were are handed down, you know, cohort to cohort generation about this is the way things have always been done. What I would love to encourage is putting those seemingly small practices and norms under the microscope and auditing them, thinking, asking, how does this either reproduce or help us resist and transform the racist and sexist status quo? And so it's focusing on that nitty gritty that I really want to encourage. And that's going to vary from locale to locale, from institution to institution. And unless people who are lowest on the totem pole in any organization, because they're all hierarchical and in, in the case of the university, very feudalistic, unless the people lowest on the totem pole are empowered to raise their insights and their concerns, then we're really still giving lip service to DEI. That is to say, if the context is not there for the people who are often closest to the ground that can see things that the higher ups can't, can't raise their hand in a context and say, I think this is going to be this is going to come back to haunt us if we don't deal with this. I, I see X, Y and Z as part of the problem. Then we really have to to ask ourselves if this is just more reputation washing, if this is for our public image or whether we're really serious about this, about encoding and gendering equity and justice in our own backyards and our own workplaces. Thank you. I want to I want to ask a question from Bella, who notes that mm -hmm. she is a 2020 graduate of Columbia's Institute for Research in African American Studies. Congratulations and cited many of the concepts from race after tech in her senior thesis. Um, she says over the last few years, Microsoft has launched its responsible AI initiative to address and mitigate fairness issues in AI systems. Um, as a company that in some ways is complicit in sowing anti-Black technology practices into the socio-political fabric, how can we ensure that we approach responsible AI responsibly, intentionally, and inclusively? Uh, and is it even possible for a company like Microsoft or any of our other big tech cohorts uh, to design and build what you're calling abolitionist tools? Uh, thank, thanks, Bella. I think that that's one of the million dollar questions that we should be asking. Um, so I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is what my colleague Sophia Noble <laughs> often uh, starts with, which is before Microsoft or any company thinks about creating something that is um, useful or inclusive or abolitionist, it needs to pay its taxes. <laughs> so it needs to put <laughs> the put the funds, uh, you know, that it are currently being monopolized by a few, few small, you know, a, few, a small set of companies back into the public domain so that it can there can be accountability and this this can be de democratically um sort of they can have democratic oversight over where these resources go so that's the first step in terms of again thinking about reimagining the relationship between technology and society is that the tech industry needs to decenter itself as the solution to all of our problems <laughs> you know they it it you know, is en enamored with its own sense of importance in terms of solving the problems of the world, which although sometimes there's definitely a sense, you know, that kind of do-gooding ethos that animates so much of tech development, that has, that has been the case in many other iterations of racial domination and social domination. Eugenics was a progressive movement. That is those who we would now on the political spectrum consider progressives were the architects of eugenic policy practices and norms. So do-gooding ideas, the idea of progress itself is not inherently beneficent or good. And so again, decentering itself as the solution to all the problems, which also then means using the resources that are currently monopolized by the tech industry to put in the hands of those communities and organizations that should be stewarding abolitionist tools, which answers your second question. I don't <laughs> think the source of these tools are these tech companies, but they are currently monopolizing the resources and the wealth that could be used by the people who know better um, to develop the kinds of technologies or not. Maybe the, those resources won't necessarily be used to develop some new technology. And that's part of reclaiming power 
the power to actually say that technology is not the answer, we're going to put it into X, Y, and Z um, as the solution. And there's some great examples, again, that I, I've talked about it in other versions of the talk and that I'm happy to talk with offline of communities doing just that. Um, I would encourage folks to look up, um, I'll put a link in the chat, TCI, uh, TCIAA in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was a community that refused an innovation project between the public schools and the police department and demanded that the community be given the resources to decide how best to support the youth um, in their community. Fantastic. We have a lot of other questions that I wish we had time to get to, but unfortunately we are coming to the end of our time. Thank you so much. This has been amazing as always. Um, reminds me of one of my favorite of your lines that the road to hell is paved with tech solutionism. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to uh, remind everybody that if you missed the earlier talks from Charlton McElwain, Kim Tallbear, and Sarita Amrude, they are available and there's links in the uh, in the chat thread, and there will be a link to this talk there later if you want to make sure that all your friends and family see it as well. Um, and please join us on September 22nd when we will have Professor Lisa Nakamura from the University of Michigan, who will be talking about women of color and the digital labor of repair, which I'm sure is also going to be double thumbs up awesome. So thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Love your support of this series and see you next month. Thanks.